Sportsbit is powered by Bet Online, driving the opening odds market since 2001. Visit sportsbookreview.com to learn more about Bet Online and its A plus rated platform in the link below. Back at it, Sportsbit, Betting Insight today, Paulie and Teddy, Thursday, October 26th. Big game breakdown. Thursday means the four marquee college games get to Penn State and Ohio State, TCU, Iowa State. Notre Dame at home against NC State, Oklahoma State, and West Virginia. All that straight ahead. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. A close to a moose. The under was a vicious beat. So was the side. This year, the Dodgers were 98-0 when they led after eight innings. Jansen blows it in the ninth. They, they, they had uh, what, 28 consecutive scoreless innings out of the bullpen. It was 3-1 to one in the eighth. The Astros were 7-1 to one in play in the bottom of the eighth. It's a wild 7-6 to six win, eight home runs. That's a World Series record, series tied at one. Yeah, everyone's going to be talking about this game today, and deservedly so. So, let's start with a look at it from a Las Vegas perspective. That's what we do here on Sportsbit. The Astros took money, and the over took money. So, it was not a good game uh, for the house yesterday. Certainly, when you talk about tough beats, the under, as tough as it gets. I was on the lucky side uh, of that one last night. I mean, you ask yourself, what are the odds of Marwin Gonzalez? Look at the pick right here, hitting that home run off of Kenley Jansen on an 0-2 pitch. He was choking up on the bat. That was insane. And then, of course, the betting markets recognized once the game was tied after nine that it was the Astros with the edge because Dave Roberts has gone all in with his bullpen already. You know, that set the stage for the explosion in the 10th and the 11th. Houston was minus 125 in running after nine inning. And that was entirely uh, because of the uh, available relief pitchers for the two squads. And that certainly played out. Josh Fields may have had the worst performance by a relief pitcher in MLB history. He faced three batters. He lasted six pitches, gave up two home runs and a double. Roberts is terrific. The best thing that happened to this team is they got rid of Mattingly and brought him in. He had a bad yep. night. McCarthy shouldn't be on the roster. He hadn't pitched since October 1st and five times since the All-Star break. That's the guy you go to in game two. And Utley, I don't know why he plays. He doesn't have a hit in the postseason either. He should have come <laughs> up with that ground ball hit by Redick, who uh, came around to score the first run. They were going to win that series. Tough. They weren't going to lose four out of five. I thought they were going to win with two hits. The home runs were going to hold up. Would have been the fifth time in World Series history that was going to happen. So Darvish goes tomorrow on the road, game three. Uh, another tough beat, NBA. Grizzlies, Mavs over 197 and a half. You get beat by the hook. Was on the pace yeah. to go over the whole game. In the last minute and change, only one basket. It stays under. Mavs get the win. Yeah, yeah. You need a, <laughs> you need a half point that final minute, Polly. And you know what happens when you need a half point the final minute? Brick, brick. Brick, oh, it's just not close enough to foul. The Mavs took a lot of money last night, bet from plus five down to plus three. It was a tough beat for overbetters. It was a bad outcome for the books with Dallas winning that game in outright fashion, getting off the schneid against the Memphis Grizzlies. Bet for the books, Pistons, plus one and a half, went off a two and a half point home favorite against the T-Wolves. No Jimmy Butler again and a big problem. They cannot defend, and a team that had to win 18 18- they had to have an 18-game improvement to go over their win total with all these moves. It's taken time to gel, but they can't defend. Gave up 130 to the Pacers, and the Pistons dropped 120 on them. T-Wolves get run out. Yeah, yeah. Detroit with a 24 to nothing edge in fast break points in that ballgame. Here's a quote from Stan Van Gundy talking about the Pistons side of the equation. Quote, we're getting better defensively. Andre makes us a great rebounding team, and our point guards are moving the ball. We want to run, and those are the things that made it possible. Minnesota transition defense wasn't there last year, and it's not there yet to open up the 2017 campaign. Bad bet. Cavs can't defend. This is a lousy team right now. LeBron playing all these minutes. They were lucky they got by the Bulls at home. Then they go to Brooklyn and get beat. And LeBron play in major minutes already in October. But, the, I mean, the, Russell didn't even play with the Nets. And they got what they wanted <laughs> offensively. LeBron also missed a key free throw down the stretch, too. Yeah, I mean, the Cavs are laying eight in that ballgame. They lose outright. And you talk about LeBron playing 41 minutes in an October game 
against Brooklyn on the second night of back-to-backs, I don't know how you get any more red flag than that. You know, uh, the Cavs give up 17 three-pointers for the second straight night. And, of course, the talk, oh, maybe we'll play LeBron at the point now. He's playing point guard. You know, uh, certainly when it comes to the defensive end of the equation, LeBron's a little bit slow at getting after shooters. I don't think he's a natural fit at the Cavs at point guard for a long-term solution. A couple of totals. Uh, there was under money bet for the books, under money in that Washington Laker game, 102.99, not even close. They would open 230 and a half the total. Warriors Raptors from 224 up to 230 and a half. They were a lot of high scoring games the last few years between these two teams. It fell 219 as that didn't get there either. The Warriors won. And it's definitely a change in Golden State this season compared to last season's. They've gone from having one of the best benches in the league. Maybe two years ago, they probably had the best bench in the NBA. This is not a great bench this season. And, you know, that's one of the things that happens when you have to pay for superstars. The big four, you know, Curry, Thompson, Green, Durant, 96 points last night. Only 21 from all the others. Like Cleveland. I don't know that Golden State's going to be making a whole lot of money for their supporters in early season play. Same bench as last year, though. They'll be okay. Uh, college football early week line moves. Florida State taking money at BC. That surprises me. One team headed on the uptick. The other one is a mess with four losses. Look at this. BYU is 0-8 against the spread this year. They're betting against BYU. They're playing one of the worst teams. Well, they are bad. But San Jose State might be the worst team in college football. San Jose State is taking money. Missouri taking money against UConn. Colorado against Cal. And Sparty. And a great revenge spot at Northwestern taking money. Yeah, and uh, let's start with the top one. The Friday night game, Florida State uh, taking money against Boston College. No surprise here that the Seminoles are taking money. They've taken money a lot this year. You know, when you grade out Florida State's personnel, when you look at the series history, they have to be chalk and bigger chalk, perhaps, against Boston College. You look at current form and the actual team, you can make a case for the Eagles. But from a talent perspective, of Florida State grades out pretty darn good. Uh, and you talk about BYU. And, you know, imagine being Kalani Satake and seeing that the markets, you know, this is a team that has yet to cover a point spread this season. And they're still laying double digits against San Jose. And San Jose has been god awful this season. I mean, bottom tier football team. It's a type of squad that BYU, yeah. just by lining up and running the football, is supposed to beat by three touchdowns. Markets, not so enthusiastic in, Cal- in California team that hasn't won on the road in their last 10 tries in Pac-12 play. Markets moving against them in early betting action this week. Up next, big game breakdown. A lot of marquee games, and they're all at the same time in the afternoon. We'll start with (laughs) TCU-Iowa State. Where did this come from? Third-string quarterback leading the charge in the turnaround. And Notre Dame, another tough game against NC State. Straight ahead on Sportsbit. Betting insight today on SBRPicks.com. Hey guys, thanks for stopping by Sportsbook Review, YouTube's largest sports betting channel. Every day we're here giving you the most up-to-date news and info, all to help you make the best bet. On top of that, guys, it's free. So look, do us a favor, click the like button, subscribe to our channel, leave a comment or a question. Our goal here is to make sure that everyone becomes a smarter, better. So join the SPR Army today and start winning with Sportsbook Review. Back on Sportsbit, betting inside today. Big game breakdown. Check out the bonus page, sportsbookreview.com, for the latest and best offers to open a new account today. Always sponsored and empowered by Bet Online. Check out the SBR odds and picks page after you watch this video about what you want to do in the line movement on these four games. NC State, Notre Dame, 1230 Pacific on NBC. The Irish are 7, 58 the total. NC State beat Notre Dame at home last year in a hurricane. The, the, no let up here with the Irish. They just beat USC. Here's another ranked team. They still play Miami and Stanford in the two, quote, easy games are Navy and Wake Forest. A brutal schedule the rest of the way. No doubt if they run the table, they're in the playoff. The key has been the running game. Adams averaging nine yards per carry, and they had 377 yards rushing in the win against uh, USC last week. Of course, you line up behind that senior laden offensive line with a pair of potential first-round NFL draft choice, and you can understand why Josh Adams is having the type of season that uh, he's having. 
105 carries for 967 yards, Paulie. That's 9.2 yards per carry, eight touchdowns. It's not easy for a running back to maintain nine plus yards per carry when he's gotten 100 carries for the season. Uh, Adams at 105 now, and he's still above nine. Certainly, when it comes down to lining up, smashing your opponent at the line of scrimmage, Notre Dame is as good as anybody in the country. When it comes to the quarterback play, however, I don't know about that. Brandon Wimbush, only 51.3% completions this season, just six yards per pass. There aren't a whole lot of teams in college football that average a full yard more per run than per pass. And then the best defense Wimbush has faced this season, uh, that was Georgia. Uh, Notre Dame's offense didn't work in that game. Wimbush completed only 48% of his passes and 5.4 yards per attempt. And Georgia, the one team that you can compare to NC State when it comes to defensive acumen. Don't sell the Wolfpack short. Their defense is loaded, Paul. He really is. Number six in the country against the run. Unique scheduling spot for them as well. They have Clemson on deck, the marquee showdown. They're probably thinking about winning the conference, not in the national championship hunt. So, uh, it's also a revenge game for Notre Dame, as I mentioned earlier. But NC State plays the 4-2-5. And how rare is it that they start all seniors up front? If you see, you got Street, Hill, Jones, Chubb, Fernandez, and more. All seniors and all big guys. And I'm okay with Finley at quarterback. 11 touchdowns and no interceptions. Elko also was brought in. Uh, Notre Dame brought Elko in a cor- uh, as their defensive coordinator. And he's done a great job turning that around as well. But with Finley... They had that weird game to start against South Carolina where they dominated on the, on the stat sheet, but had some silly turnovers and lost a tough game since then. They had the big win at Florida State, and Finley's been playing well. What do you think? That's uh, This is a pass for me. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game, though. I'll take the other side of that because when you look at Notre Dame's strengths, NC State defensively matches up very, very well with what the Irish want to do. When you look at NC State and Finley, and again, solid QB, I'm not going to call him an elite QB. I'm not going to call him a guy who's going to make a bunch of play for you on the highway. And uh, the Irish, you know, let's not sell that defense short. Uh, If I'm playing this one, I'm looking at the under, not the over. I think it's going to be a very different flow than we saw from Notre Dame against USC last week. All right, game number two. Bet online odds, TCU, Iowa State, TCU six and a half on the road, 48 and a half the total. Last three in this series, last three years, TCU was laying 35, 155 to three, laying 21, 145 to 21, and laying 24 and a half, 141 to 20. The markets are buying into Iowa State's improvements and what Campbell has done. And a blessing in disguise, though, is Park got hurt, and they had to go to this third string quarterback, Kemp. And they had the huge win as a 31-point dog at Oklahoma, spanked Kansas, and got the win against Texas Tech. Fifth-year Iowa State seniors, 3-9, and 2-10, and 3-9, and 3-9 and and prior to this season. Campbell went 6-3 and three ATS in his first Big 12 season, 3-1 and one ATS so far. And now they're on the uptick, 5-2. and two. Can you believe it? They're actually ranked, Teddy. Yeah, and that's always a concern when your team that's not used to being ranked all of a sudden gets ranked and has to step up in class against a quality foe. And certainly, again, you look at that graphic, a team that hadn't won more than three games in the previous four seasons is sitting at 5-2 and two, uh, right now. And a lot of it has to do with the second-half adjustments. Look, I like Matt Campbell a lot. You know, when you talk about the fact that he went 6-3 and three against the number in his first Big 12 season and 3-1 and one against the spread so far this season in Big 12 play. But you look at the second half of these games, they've been even better when it comes to betting on Iowa State after halftime. They've outscored opponents 134 to 61 in the second half this season. That includes a 60 to 17 edge in Big 12 play. So it's been real good halftime adjustment. You talk about, you know, the departure of Jacob Park. You know, uh, I mean, Kyle Kemp is a guy who's a walk-on, a former walk-on, now completing 70% of his passes. 8.7 8.7 yards per attempt, seven touchdowns to one pick. The key, the tall receivers. They've got two tall guys. And Hakeem Butler, he's 6'6", uh, and Alan Lazard is 6'5". Those are big weapons. You can just chuck it up there, and those guys can catch it. That's created matchup problems with a lot of uh, Iowa State's early 
Big 12 foes. It's a Gary Patterson defense. It's a typical TCU team. They're nasty on defense as they uh, lead the Big 12 in defense and number 11 in the nation. The cornerbacks are a little uh, small, six feet and uh, 5'10", and the guys behind them are 5'11 and 5'10". So size could be a problem against those big Iowa State wide receivers, as you mentioned. Tough on the road. No problem so far. Thumped Arkansas 28-7. One at Stillwater 44-31. Very impressive win. And beat Kansas State 26-6. Beat the spread by 53 points in those games. Kenny Hill, not bad so far. Complete 70% of his passes. 15 touchdowns and three interceptions. And also, which was a blessing in disguise, Hicks, the running back, got hurt. Missed a couple games. That allowed Anderson to flourish. 530 yards and six touchdowns. As a result, they now have some depth at running back. Sure, we're talking about a team with depth at running back, a team with a senior quarterback that's completed more than 70% of his passes and a 15-3 to TD to INT ratio against some decent competition. We're talking about a squad that has consistently been able to dominate foes away from home, as you mentioned, plus 53 uh, ATS in their three uh, row games, and a team that's playing defense. So. The biggest, my biggest concern about TCU here is those Iowa State receivers making a couple of big plays downfield uh, and potentially coming through the back door. But you're grading this game out, X's and O's. TCU, a good notch or two better than Iowa State, perhaps a little bit more than that point spread might indicate, laying less than a touchdown, betting against the Cyclones. The monster game in the Big, Twen, the Big Ten, Penn State and Ohio State up next. And uh, Oklahoma State, West Virginia did not make the cut. It's Georgia Tech and Clemson in prime time. And a stat on Urban Meyer you will not believe. Next on SportsBit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. Back on SportsBit, Betting Insight today. Big game breakdown rolls on. You know how we do it on a Thursday with big game breakdown. Live odds. Uh, we sponsored and powered by Bet Online, Georgia Tech, and Clemson. Prime time, 5 o'clock Pacific. Clemson is 14, 49 the total. Johnson said this is the best team and quarterback he's ever had with Marshall. Georgia Tech, two losses, but they're 6 and 0 this year against the spread. They were right there and, and should have beat Miami, and they should have beat Tennessee to start the season. Can they get stops, though, as Bryant's back? I'm not, I think they'll move the ball. It's a good Clemson defense. But it comes down to this Georgia Tech defense. But as I talked about Marshall, 144 rush attempts. He can throw the ball, too, which is rare and a luxury that Johnson isn't used to, that his quarterback can air it out when he needs to. Well, look, I I mean, uh, Georgia Tech, gimmicky offense. Let's just call it what it is. You know, Johnson loves his tricks. The trick plays really work well. And lesser teams have a really difficult time stopping Georgia Tech. That's not the case against Clemson and Davo Swinney. Swinney is 6-2 and two against the spread, head-to-head uh, against Paul Johnson. They've won each of the last two years in dominating fashion by 19 points each time. And the key stat for me in those two Clemson wins over the last two years against Georgia Tech, they held the Yellow Jackets to 96 and 71 rushing yards. Those are the two lowest totals for the Ramblin' Wreck in the entire Paul Johnson era. So you're talking about Taquan Marshall with 144 rushing attempts, Cavante Benson 117. No one else has in the team has more than 26. At wide receiver, Ricky June has, what, 15 catches. No one else has more than three. So we're talking about an offense that if you can stop three guys, you can basically stop Georgia Tech. Clemson got the defense to be able to stop three guys. Yeah, here's Sweeney. I agree with him. Georgia Tech is truly two plays away from being 6-0. and I have no idea how they lost to Tennessee. Me either. Just watching the tape. They dominated that game. The Miami game, it came down to 1-4th and 10. Two defenders go up. It was raining. A ball came down on the other guy's chest, and he caught it. This is a 4-2 and two team, but truly two plays away from being undefeated. Sweeney and Venables get added prep time versus the option off the bye week. The question is, can they win by margin? and cover a big point spread here as they scored 28 against Wake and 24 against Syracuse. Bryant back, as we mentioned, which is big. And what do you make of the running game, which has four good running backs, but are these stats misleading? 
They're definitely misleading. Paul, let's throw that graphic up there real quick with the Clemson running backs. You're going to see these great yards per rush averages, you know, 8.7, 5.9, 4.8, 4.4. But all four of those backs have had at least one home, you know, we'll call it a home run play uh, this season. You look at the long, you take the one long carry out of the mix, and all of a sudden those numbers don't quite look as dominant for the Clemson running backs. And, of course, we're talking about a Clemson offense. You know, when you're scoring 28 against Wake, you're scoring 24 against Syracuse. Uh, and, of course, uh, a touchdown of, against Syracuse came on a fumble return, so really only 17 of those came from the offense. We have a quarterback in Kelly Bryan who's been banged up. Uh, He's only thrown four touchdown passes all season in 176 pass attempts, as many interceptions as TDs. My biggest concern about Clemson is not shutting down Georgia Tech. It's being able to score enough to win this game by margin. That Clemson offense has been hit or miss for extended stretches so far this season. Last up, the monster game, 1230 Pacific on Fox Ohio State is six and a half and 56 and a half at home against Penn State. Must win for the Buckeyes if they want to stay in the playoff picture. Penn State, after they just played Michigan, if they can win this game, they go to uh, Sparty after this, then they should be home free. Myers two and one straight up, but one and two ATS against uh, Penn State the last few years, 124 21. Last year, they were 17 and a half point dog, and Penn State won on that blocked field goal. That launched the Penn State turnaround. And they took off from there and lost a great Rose Bowl to USC. Urban Meyer, 20-0 and straight up after the bye since his last loss when he was at Bowling Green. And that was to Roethlisberger in Miami, <laughs> Ohio. Unbelievable. 47-4 and straight up, 36-12-1 and ATS in all games with more than one week to prepare. And I think Penn State's Fugazi. They haven't played anybody and they should have lost to Iowa on the road. And that's a below average Iowa team. Yeah, and again, those numbers are worth repeating. 20-0 and straight up after a bye since he was at Bowling Green, and that was a great find. He lost to Ben Roethlisberger when Big Ben was yeah. still at Miami, Ohio. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's a hell of a stat. When you're talking about a coach with a 75% ATS mark over a 49-game sample size in this role, that's meaningful. And of course, I mean, the offense has really picked up in recent weeks. You know, a JT Barrett, 8.9 yards per pass, 21 touchdowns to one INT. J.K. Dobbins, 775 yards, five touchdowns at 7.8 yards per carry. But we do got to worry about the weather on Saturday night in Columbus. Here's mm-hmm. Kevin Wilson, the offense coordinator Afternoon. for Ohio State, talking about that weather forecast. Quote, it's Big Ten football weather. As the weather changes and you play these great teams down the stretch, It's when you really see if you have balance. What if the elements are such that you can't execute the passing game? You still have to move the football. Dicey weather expected on Saturday night. The uh, devil's advocate with Ohio State is they're doing what Urban Meyer does, which is run it up on bad teams. So those stats Mm -hmm. can be misleading as they haven't beat anybody either lately. Barkley having a big year right there with Love, the favorites to win the Heisman, and they're getting them the ball multiple ways. 117 touches in the running game, eight touchdowns, 32 in the passing game. And Urban Meyer on Barkley, I'd be careful to say this, but he's as good as any all-purpose running back we've seen, and that's 30 years. No disrespect for the great running backs. You have different ways of bottling up great running backs. It's hard, especially this guy, really hard. Do they have what it takes to win on the road? Penn State yet to prove themselves on the road. In the winning streak last year, the only Big Ten road games down the stretch were... In the last two years, the road wins Purdue, Indiana, Rutgers, and Iowa. And as I mentioned earlier, they beat Iowa on the final play of the game, and they couldn't do much on offense in that one. To me, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, when Penn State played Iowa, they were the better team. They dominated the box score. They did not dominate the scoreboard. And you can't even compare this Iowa team uh, to Ohio State. You know, Iowa, very mediocre in 2017. Ohio State, despite the earlier loss to Oklahoma, they still feel themselves as being playoff worthy. Money time, play of the day. Back to this game and Meyer, we trust. What are we doing, Teddy? Sure. Let's go to game number 206. The squares hate this play, Polly. They hate it. Recreational betters all over Penn State this week. Not us. 
We're going to go with the Ohio State Buckeyes, minus six and a half, 36, 12, and one ATS, long-term track record with extra time repair for Urban Meyer. That is a track record worthy of support. The point spread says it. The point spread says very clearly Ohio State's better on a neutral than Penn State. We believe it. And this game's in Columbus. Buckeyes minus the six and a half. That's the play of the day. Very good. We're back tomorrow. Weekend preview edition. Game three of the World Series. Scene shifts to Houston and the three uh, decent games in the NFL. Highlighted by Pittsburgh and Detroit Sunday night and the Cowboys and Redskins. We'll talk to you then on SportsBit. Betting insight today on SBRPicks.com. Tell your friends. Thanks for watching. We'll